thanks for the invitation. So my name is uh, Mark Falcone. I'm a urological surgeon at the Molinetto University Hospital in uh, Torino, in the north uh, of Italy. So my main, main activity is mainly focused on reconstructive surgery. Um, and after my training uh, in UK, I've been starting since uh, four or five years uh, the gender affirming surgery. And I'm in charge uh, of the genital, genital, the genital affirming surgery in female to male patients. So the center of Torino is one of the biggest center in, uh, in Italy is uh, at the moment the, re the referral center for F2M surgery, as we propose almost uh, all the disposable technique nowadays. It was uh, uh, built uh, in, the, in the early 2000s, uh, nearly 15 years so when the, the gender uh, center have been uh, created. So we started uh, with the uh, vaginoplasty at the really beginning. And then I was sent uh, in UK for training. Then I've been also to Belgrade uh, in order to, to improve my skills in uh, female to male uh, genital affirming surgery. And as I said before, essentially we started the activity in a high, as a high volume center more or less four or five years ago. And uh, as far as I know, at the moment is what probably is the biggest center for female to male surgery in Italy if we con concerning the number of procedure that we, we perform every year. We perform uh, different techniques. So we propose our patient uh, methodoplasty for the one are interested in, the, in a mini phalloplasty. Okay, I don't want to perform a full length phalloplasty. And concerning is that the full length phalloplasty, we, we, we manage almost all the existing technique. So the preferred choice is normally the radial free flap phalloplasty, but we also use the anterolateral tie flap phalloplasty, the pubic pedicle, super pubic pedicle phalloplasty. We may also perform a latissimus dorsi, but it's not a, my preferred choice, personally speaking. Present moment, uh, if we discuss the, if we see at the, the, the scientific literature, it's difficult to say uh, which technique is the best. I believe that if we, cons if we see at all the possible result achievable with a phalloplasty, so in terms of uh, aesthetical aspect, uh, aspect of the phallus, uh, sensitivity, both cutaneous and erogenous sensitivity. Uh, and the possible to achieve uh, penetrative sexual intercourse is uh, the evidence uh, uh, suggests that probably the radial free flap phalloplasty is the best technique. As a last stage, so we normally wait at least other four, four, six, four to six months. Uh, we, we go for the, for the implantation of the penal prosthesis. Uh, it's important, in my opinion, to wait at least nine to 12 months after the, the phallic reconstruction before considering a, a, an implantation of a penile prosthesis because, at least speaking of uh, the radial free flap phalloplasty, we said that the, there is possibility in around 78-80% of patients to achieve some sensation in the phallus itself. And this is a crucial point because it allows the patient with, a, with an implant in uh, to moderate the pressure of the implant that the implant may have in the apex in the phallus. So it makes sense to me to wait and see any possible sensitivity of the neophallus has developed completely before going for the for the phallic implantation itself, but that's something that I, it's a personal opinion because there are very few few articles exploring uh, the sensitivity outcome after phalloplasty. I personally think that uh, 
inflatable uh, devices as uh, some advantages have some advantages when implanted into a phalloplasty. Uh, the problem for you know, the implantation of a phalloplasty that is that mainly you leak of any structure that normally is present uh, in a genetic male patient, which are the corpora cavernosa that can helps and uh, uh, allows the implantation. So you normally have just skin and subcutaneous tissue. So that's the main issue. So it's important, first of all, to choose a proper implant that will allow you to fix the proximal aspect of the, uh, of the implant uh, to, the, um, to, the, to the pubic bone to give uh, proximal stability to your cylinders. And then we, we, sh we, may, uh, we have to think of something to protect the apex of the cylinder in order to reduce as much as possible the risk of extrusion. So for me, are both them rigid that inflatable implants can be used as implantation into phalloplasty, but most of my implants, to be fair, are inflatables. That's for my suggestions and also for uh, the, 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 the preferences of my patients, essentially. You know, I started my, uh, my experience with uh, the genital affirming surgery in transgender men using uh, uh, the standard uh, genetic male uh, implants. I've also published the, the biggest series nowadays uh, present in the scientific literature, more than 200 cases when I was in London. So that's something we may propose, but there's some weakness, of course. First of all, it's an implant that it is not designed for this kind of patients. So you need to consider some operative time that must be dedicated to the modification of the implant. So most of the phalloplasty won't accept a double cylinder. So first of all, in more than 9% of patients, you must excise one of the switch cylinder of the implant. Secondly, um, you won't have any structure to fix the proximal part of your cylinder to the, to the, to the bone. So you need to uh, insert some other uh, accessory uh, tissues when I switched to dedicated phalloplasty implants, so an implant that is designed for phalloplasty that has several features uh, that are dedicated for this implantation, I, have the, I had the impression that the incidence of complication, particularly in terms of infection, has dramatically dropped down. So this is something that must be confirmed in the next futures uh, but that's my personal feeling that we are on the right way. So this is something that has changed our practice nowadays. And that's the feeling that I share also with my, my other colleagues that follows this uh, the, same, the same way and do uh, most of uh, these dedicated implants nowadays uh, in Lyon and Ghent. Uh, so we have the feeling that something has changed, something very important. Uh, but we need more data to, to demonstrate our impression, our first impressions. Um, so just to conclude, uh, I believe that the, the dedicated implant that we have nowadays for phalloplasty have different advantages. They may have advantages in terms of a drop down of infections. Uh, they will probably have on the long term also some advantages on the mechanical failure rate that could be lower when compared to genetic male implants. But that's also probably uh, something easier to implant uh, for the surgeon itself because uh, we have something that is already fit and ready for the implantation, uh, which saves time. Uh, and saving time in implant surgery means also less, less exposure of the implant itself uh, to, the, uh, to the air. And probably this is another factor that may influence the, the reducing of uh, infectious complication in this uh, uh, in the series that are have been published recently. That's something I would like to understand. That's something uh, that I can feel uh, and uh, is shared by my uh, other colleagues uh, worldwide. 
also that functional results might be better with these implants, but still we don't have any uh, validated questionnaires to assess the functional outcomes after implants in phalloplasty. So it's difficult to compare the outcomes nowadays, but the feeling is that they may also have some advantages also in terms of patient satisfaction. My patients with the, this new implant are pretty satisfied about the, uh, the, the pump itself. They found pretty easy to inflate and deflate. I believe the, keys, the key for achieving this result is to create a nice scrotum. Uh, I found that uh, when I perform a full scrotoplasty in vaginectomy, uh, I have probably more space uh, to place my pump uh, and it's still more stable instead of having the pump uh, in the major labia. Uh, so this uh, may play a role in facilitating patient to use the, uh, the pump itself. Um, I was worried at the really beginning about the membrane that covers the pump which essentially was created uh, to, to give more cosmetical acceptable results. That is great because essentially when we compare the pump side with the, the, the testicular implant side, they, they feel very similar. Uh, that's that's uh, something that must be highlighted in this dedicated implant when compared to the other implant. Uh, I was worried at the really beginning for the fact that this membrane may influence uh, uh, the ability of the patient to, to inflate and deflate, but I must say that it's, it's not influencing, negatively influencing at all. So what I normally uh, do, I prepare my patient to the fact that the inflation and the deflation of the implant may be difficult at the really beginning, but that's quite common in, uh, in uh, transgender men and in genetic male patients. That's something new, something mechanical, and as so it's normal that you will need a learning curve to start uh, activating and deactivating the system uh, easily. So it's just a matter of time. Uh, so you must be patient. The patient must be patient, of course, and also the doctor. Uh, it will come. Uh, I normally suggest my patient at the really beginning to start and do the inflation and deflation three, four times a week. Um, but they, they normally take confidence with the, with the pump uh, in a couple of weeks. I don't remember any of my patients that regretted an inflatable implant because of the difficulties in activating or deactivating the implant. So. All, <laughs> almost all. I remember one patient that was just interested uh, in having a full-size phalloplasty and particularly had a uh, pubic but just for a cosmetical appearance. He was not interested in uh, penetrative sexual intercourse. Apart from this single case, uh, all other patients that uh, goes for a full uh, size reconstruction, they normally ask for a, an implant device. Yeah, we received them. I've started doing uh, quite a lot of consultation in the last uh, month. Um, we have a, a clinic where we can perform uh, uh, surgeries for patients coming from abroad, uh, as well as the hospital, the public health national system, if they are covered in Italy, of course. But uh, I believe we may found uh, any type of uh, accordance with the local national health system or assurance uh, for uh, covering uh, the operation in, uh, in Torino, it's not a big issue. So yes, we, we, we are happy to receive patients from abroad. If they, if they trust us, if they want to come to us, uh, I would be glad to receive them. It's not a big issue. I've implanted a lot of patients that have been operated for phalloplasty in other centers. I mean, uh, I didn't find any kind of complication. That's also because we manage almost all the possible flap used in reconstruction. So we normally know where the important vascular structure are placed. So we don't have any problem doing, for example, an implant 
na, na phalloplasty done in another center. So that's not a big issue. Of course, it's always nice to have some documentation about the previous operations. It's helpful for us, but it's, it's feasible. It's very easy, just write me and uh, I will be happy to give some information you need. Uh, uh, I also perform uh, online consultations, which is very helpful. I found it very helpful for uh, to manage at the, at the early stages uh, patient coming from abroad. Uh, I like always to have a first contact uh, online before asking patient, of course, to come to me for a full uh, consultation uh, in real in real life. But that's something very helpful. It's also useful for patient to really understand if the operation and the reconstructive technique I propose are suitable for, for them and uh, they achieve to, uh, satis to satisfy the requirements. So it's something I would suggest. So write me and we can manage to arrange an online consultation as a first step and then uh, proceed further for life, real life consultation and eventually operations. For a video consultation is probably um, between one week and one, two weeks, not more than that. The outbreak, the COVID outbreak has been uh, tough for, for all countries. Uh, in Italy, we, had, uh, we are still under a strong wave uh, uh, of COVID outbreak. So health national system for this kind of reconstructive surgery has been uh, partially blocked this year, but among the different, uh, among the, the different waves of COVID outbreaks, we had the, the possibilities to operate. So we have a reduced a bit number of operation, but not that much, hopefully. Uh, concerning the private clinic activity, we, we, we are fully operating, so that's not a big issue. But uh, well, let's hope that's the final wave of this COVID outbreak and then we go back to our previous life. I'm pretty com confident you know, with vaccination we are going back from this bad situation.